right, church, well, if you would, grab your Bibles or if you have some sort of device that you can get into the Scriptures. We're going to be in the book of Romans this morning, chapter 14, and reading and teaching from the New Living Translation this morning. Um, I'm sure you've heard this if you've been here for a few weeks or months, but often we'll, we'll kind of teach from the New King James Version. Sometimes we'll, we'll reference the New Living Translation, and this morning we'll be in the New Living Translation. So if you have a device that you can kind of pick which translation you're reading from this morning, that's the one we'll be in. Um, but Romans 14 this morning, we're going to entitle our time together very, very simply, kind of like this, when life's a little gray. This morning, we're learning just as we have been about how to live our lives in light of the gospel. But sometimes things in life aren't always clear, black and white in your decision making. And so this morning, Romans chapter 14, at at least the first 13 verses that we're going to be considering this morning, they really speak to how to live your life, how to navigate decisions and challenges and Areas that that may seem, well, a little unclear, a little uncertain, a little gray. But all of that is in response to this, some people call it this, the meta-narrative. Big, like, word that nerd people, no, I'm just kidding, not nerd people, but just that people that study, they're they're like, well, what's the meta-narrative? What's the key theme? What's the focus? The focus of the book of Romans is the good news of the gospel. And everything that we're going to learn this morning is in light of that. And you know the good news of the gospel. You know that because God so loved the world, he gave his son Jesus. And and through his son Jesus, through faith in him, here's the thing. Let, Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. Here's the beautiful thing. You can experience forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the beautiful, powerful, life transformational truths of the good news of the gospel. That you and I can experience this beautiful thing of being forgiven of our sins. See, whether you realize it or not, when you woke up on August 2nd, 2020, you say, when is that? That's, that's right now, just in case we're trying to find our bearings. All of us are born into this world with truly a debt that we owe that we can never pay. The Bible calls it this way, says it this way, the wages of sin is death and every single person is born with a sin nature. So this is the good news. God so loves you, he actually likes you, that he decided to give you a gift, his most precious gift, his son, to bear upon his shoulders, to take that weight of sin and very simply make this claim that if you trust in, if you give your debt to him, He'll provide you with forgiveness. This isn't bad news. This isn't like, oh, we got to go to church and hear that bummer again. Like, no, this is good news. There's forgiveness. But here's the second thing. Not only is there forgiveness, there's freedom. Freedom. Sin doesn't have to have a hold on you. I heard one person once tell me, Neil, you truly have sin's involvement, power, authority in your life as much as you want. Because in Christ, you're not only forgiven, but you're free. You're free. One of the freest places to be in life is to be tempted, to be challenged, to have these different struggles and be able to say, you know what, I don't have to give in to those things. There's freedom in Christ. There's forgiveness, there's freedom. But, but listen, the good news of the gospel is also that you're a part of a brand new family. That for you and I, the most discerning, the most clarifying The most descriptive element of who we are is not necessarily our our skin color. It's not necessarily even our gender, male or female. It's not necessarily what we do to make money, where we live, who, who we vote for. But it's who we are in Christ. This is the beautiful, powerful, good news of the gospel that you can be forgiven, that you can have freedom, that you can be a part of a family. And listen... There is a future, a future for believers. God sent his son the first time to deliver us from the penalty and the power of sin. And God will send his son a second time to deliver us from the presence of sin. See, here's the powerful thing of the gospel. One day, as the Bible teaches, Jesus will come again. 
He's going to right every wrong. He's going to rule righteously. And there will be peace like we're hungering for as a world today. Let me put it for you up on the screen. This is a simple way for me to remember why the gospel is such good news. Forgiveness, freedom, family, and future. If that doesn't frame or, or change the dynamics of your life, you have not truly believed what the Bible calls good news. That you can be forgiven and free. That, that you don't walk through life alone or have to define who you are by anything other than who you are in Christ. And listen, that this world is not all there is. That one day... COVID-19 will be a thing of the past. We believe and hope that's more, you know, not just when Jesus comes back. We'd like to read that to be sooner, but the reality is there'll be no more sickness is what I'm trying to say. I mean, let me ask you a question. Is anyone stoked about that? Like all these four things? Like, no, nobody in 11 a.m. cares. 9 a.m. cared. Those must be the Christians. I don't know who you guys are. But th this beautiful thing, <laughs> forgiveness and freedom, family and future. Being a Christian is not the great bummer. It, it's embracing the good news. And the beautiful thing about your life is helping other people understand and live according to that. Here, let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. That's what this morning is about. Romans 14 is about how should you then live in light of these truths. But the context is when things are gray. I mean, when things are a little bit maybe uncertain, when things are a little bit unclear. Now, we need to get a little bit of the setting of what's going on in this section of Scripture there were believers in Rome and they were having difficulty. They were having difficulty getting along. Can you believe that? Like they, they just didn't all like happy clappy, just see everything the same way. I mean, this could be a good point for a good illustration from my own life of what it's like to have seven. Let me say that again. Seven human beings in a four bed, two bath house. There, there's a lot of opportunity for illustration of challenge, difficulty, problem, frustration, just not getting along. But I'm not going to do that because we'd be here all afternoon. No, but the point is this. The believers in Rome, they had these challenges. The Jews, their, their background, they, they had a very strict religious background. Where feasts and festivals and, and holy days and, and their diet and it was a big deal. For some of the, the, the Gentile believers, they may not worry so much about diets and days but but they did live a life under bondage in worship to idols they had all this baggage kind of coming into the church and in chapter 14 Paul begins to kind of tackle some of these challenges really of of special days and special diets because honestly when it came to calories and calendar diets and days People could make a good point, could make a good case for why they believed and behaved the way that they did. But there was criticism and judgment. Now here's the deal. We don't see that dynamic today in our world, right? Like politics, pandemic, everyone's on the same page, right? Like there's no like disagreement or maybe criticisms or judgment. See, here's the thing. I think what Romans 14 has to say strongly applies to how we behave, to how we live, to how we treat one another in our own context. For their context, it was special days, special diets. We've got our own dynamics that we navigate in the 21st century, but let me share this. The truths that we'll consider this morning, I believe they point us to Jesus and they also point us to how to actually live a life that's been changed and is changing because of the good news of Jesus. So this morning we'll consider the first 13 verses of Romans 14, but it's, it's, it's our heart and our desire as we do that, that we're not just sleeping through a sermon, that we're not just, yeah, that sounds good, but we're opening our heart before the Lord and saying, Lord, take your truth and do some work. Sh show me how to live in light of what I'm learning. Speak to me, God. That's not something that, that I can do for you. I can't change your heart. At the very best, I hope this morning just to be able to serve you in such a way that maybe there's a little bit of, of clarity or illumination to the scripture and show you Jesus. That's all I can really do. But I believe the gospel and God by his spirit can radically change your life. 
to live in such a way where you're bearing fruit and enjoying the good news of the gospel in an ever-increasing way each day as you surrender to him. Father, I pray that you would do that as we consider Romans 14. I ask for your help. Lord, I don't believe that I'm the smartest person in this room, the smartest person watching online. I don't know more about the Bible than anyone else in this room. But Lord, I'm here this morning to just simply serve your people by teaching and sharing your word. And Lord, I just ask for your help in that. Lord, that you by your spirit would speak. I know who I am and I know what I have to offer that's very limited. But Lord, I know who you are. And I know your unlimited power to change lives, to repair relationships. And I pray that you'd do that. As we consider your word this morning, God, that you'd speak. Lord, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just consider the first three verses as we walk through Romans 14. Paul writes this. Accept other believers who are weak in faith. And don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. You got your prime rib crew and then you got your broccoli crew is what he's saying. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. Why? Tail end of verse 3 says this. Because or for God has accepted them. Now to really understand what Paul is saying, you've got to set your shoes, your sandals, your mind in the setting of what's going on. These, these things that he's talking about, the weak in the faith, the, the diet, why is that such a big deal? See, we don't know all the details of everything that was going on for the Christians that were in Rome, but there are some very potential problems. The, the Roman church, it was, a, it was a dynamic church that was very blended. You had people that were a part of that congregation that were both slaves and masters. You had people in that congregation that were extremely poor and extremely wealthy. And all of them, and even this is the case for our church in this day and in every church, they were all at different points in their life, different stages of growth in their walk with the Lord. And they're filled with with these believers that came out of Judaism and those that, you know, Gentiles didn't and possibly came out of the worship of some false idol. And that's where this kind of like diet dilemma, this this calorie conundrum kind of surfaces from. When the Jews became Christians, they may have been concerned about still continuing to check labels. Like, is this kosher or not? Like, can I I do this? And, And Gentile believers, they may have been worried about, you know, eating meat that were offered to idols. You may say, unpack that for me a little bit. What are you talking about? Well, There was an ancient sacrificial system at the center of both the religious and social construct of the domestic life in the ancient Roman world. And when a sacrifice was presented to an idol, or in their mind, in their eyes, a god, only part of that sacrifice, that meat, would be offered and the rest would be taken to market to sell. So a Christian could very easily and unknowingly buy such meat that was in that marketplace that had been given over to idols. And here's the challenge. Here's where you kind of get two different camps. Some that would say, well, listen, an idol's not even real. It's not anything. Like, don't worry about it. Just eat the meat. And then some believers who said, man, I used to be there in those worship services and, and offer that meat. It's just too much for me. The, the thought of eating like leftover idol meat like it just wrecks me right like that just it weighs down kind of a guilty conscience so I'm just going veggie right I'm just going with broccoli so in the the church here there's these discussions there's these challenges there's these problems those who may have felt obligated to still like every time that that calendar of the Jewish feast the seven festivals and feasts they've got to do it right every sabbath still make sure there's no leaven in the house and still kind of live the way their mama raised them right as good jewish boys and girls 
And then there's others who come in and say, why are you doing that stuff? But wait, when it comes to meat, this was offered to idols. I can't believe you're like eating the meat, but you're not eating bread with leaven. What is going on with you people? Like, so what does Paul say to do? Here's what he says to do. Start picking sides. Proof text your position and get some picket signs made, right? Like, for sure, kosher, for sure, kosher. Or maybe other guys like, idol meat, Satan's meat, idol meat, Satan's meat, right? Like, define your position, speak it clearly, and go for it. That's not what he says. You know what he says in verse 1 to do? Accept one another. Accept one another. Why? Why? Well, at the verse 3, at the very end, he explains why. Because God accepts us. Listen, there's four life principles, I really believe, that come from the passage we're in this morning about how to navigate life when things are gray. And here's the first one from verses 1 through 3. We accept one another because God accepts us. Accept It brings this idea of receiving or welcoming or loving without condemnation or judgment. But listen to me. Don't miss this. Hopefully you're not already slipping into snooze on Sunday morning. Get the context. He's not talking about obvious, clearly defined, specific sins that are outlined in the scriptures. Like in the Bible, there's clear things that the Bible just says, like, like, like hey, this is sin. He's not in here this morning, but uh, Pastor Daniel Gunthar loves LSU. So I made the point, like, that's the sin, right? Like, don't be an LSU fan. Like, no, like, there's this reality that the Bible does clearly speak to certain things that are sin. Drunkenness, gossip, envy, greed, pornography. Any kind of sexual relationship that doesn't follow this paradigm, 1M, 1W, 1L, one man, one woman for one life. Anything outside of that, don't take it completely out of context. If a spouse dies, I understand. But this reality that anything outside of that, the Bible has a lot to say. And so some, and there's so much of this in the modern church where we want to be accepting, we want to be loving. And even here in Romans 14, it's talking about that. But get it in context. He's not talking about clear, specific things that the scriptures have already spoken about. He's talking about, you know, when things get a little gray, like idol meat or like these days, like accept one another because God accepts us. And we should not expect everyone in the church, even in the best church, Coastline Gulf Breeze, no, even in any church to agree on every subject. So here's where he gets specific. He says, accept those who are weak. I remember the 90s when maybe you saw these like Christian t-shirts that were like for sale everywhere, like the Lord's Gym. Like, like what's he talking about weak? Like the guys that don't wear the t-shirts that don't go to this gym that was never really around. But like, who are these weak people? What does it mean to be a weak believer? I've referenced this before, but the Life Application Bible, such a great... um, Such a great Bible to have that brings clarity and how to apply God's word to your life at times. Listen to what it writes on this section. Who is weak in the faith and who is strong? Every believer is weak in some areas and strong in others. A person's faith is strong in an area if he or she can survive contact with sinners without falling into their patterns. The person's faith is weak in an area if that individual must avoid certain activities or people or places in order to protect his or her spiritual life. So Paul advises that those strong in an area should not argue with those who are weak about what they think is right or wrong. This is the reality. Every single breathing believer has this dynamic where like, man, I'm growing in this. I see strength in this. And then there's other dynamics. You go, man, I'm just kind of weak in that. Like it's an area where I I just really need to pay attention to that. I'm in this group on Tuesday nights. It's kind of like a a men's connect group. We're going through this book called The Pursuit of Holiness. And it's just this, this concept of how to live your life in light of who God is, just following hard after him. And he shared this illustration this week in some of the chapters that we were reading about this teenager a few years ago who was just a phenomenal tennis player, part of the National Junior Tennis League and just going after it. And it was a very bright future for this young girl. But 
the challenge for her is she was a Christian. And as she became to know the Lord more and more, she just said, you know, I feel this like this tug on my heart that honestly for me what defines me, what I breathe, what I think about, all that I am is defined by this game. And for her, she felt like I just need to step away from it. It's eating me alive. It's everything that I'm about. And so she stepped away. And the potential problem is some good, well-meaning believers could come alongside and say, listen, tennis, that, that's like morally neutral. Don't worry about it. Don't become too churchy, right? Like, don't give up that. for. Are you crazy? But he goes on to say, and I thought this was interesting, he says this. He says, certainly the game of tennis is morally neutral and under the right conditions is physically beneficial, except for August 2nd, 2020, Northwest Florida. It's hot. Like, I don't know if the physical, but anyway. But because this woman had made it an idol in her life, it become sinful to her. So you get the point. Is there anything wrong with tennis? Absolutely not. See, here's the one that's always a buzz within believers. Well, what do you do with alcohol, right? Like it's a gray area. What do you do? Some people cannot eat peanuts in a bar. You say, what do you mean by that? Like they struggle. They've had a history, even in their family or in their own personal life, where, man, anything near a drink, it's just a trigger. They have got to stay away from it because it will destroy them. And then there's others that could say, you know, honestly, like a glass of wine at a celebration or at night with dinner, it's just not a thing for me. I don't have a guilty conscience for that. Paul says this when it comes to things that are morally neutral, these special days, these special diets. Listen, you've got to be led according to your conscience under the scriptures. But here's the deal. For some, it's just a death blow to their walk with the Lord. And in context, Paul is telling these believers, listen, for some, this this meat, it's not a thing. For others, it's a thing. It's weird. And as believers, we're we're all weak in some areas. So here's the dynamic he says. Listen, don't fight with, argue, condemn, look down upon, despise, reject with contempt. Don't expect everyone to agree on everything in the essentials, yes. But in the non-essentials, listen to one another, respect one another, give one another space. Differences shouldn't be feared or avoided, but accepted and handled with love. Because acceptance always creates room for growth and rejection always stunts it in this scenario. And he says this, why should you accept one another? Because listen, God accepts you. The biggest challenge in your life, especially to these people in context, it wasn't the diets and the days, it was sin. And God sent his son so that he could accept them. So here's the point. If God accepts them, the biggest deal in their life isn't the diets and the days, it's the sin issue. And God's dealt with that. And he now accepts them. And they are a work in progress just like you and me. So because God accepts us, may we accept one another. And listen, he builds upon that in verse 4. Look at what he says. Who, Who are you to condemn someone else's servant? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Here's the second thing we're learning this morning. It's simply this. We've got to remember that people belong to God, not you or me. Paul says, listen, every believer belongs to the Lord. They're his servant. Believers will ultimately be judged by God, not their pastor, not their parents, not you, not me, not, not anyone. And so he's saying, listen, believers, gosh, you don't really have the right to condemn. They don't belong to you. Now listen, again, l- let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. Don't take this out of context. He's talking about areas that are gray, not areas that the scripture speaks to very clearly. And this is the challenge of much of the modern church. We so want to be accepting that we just begin to kind of accept any kind of sin that creeps in. But he's saying, listen, it's not your job to judge in those gray areas. One of the greatest lessons I ever learned from Pastor Chuck Smith, I had the opportunity to be at a Bible college where he would teach a men's discipleship class every Thursday. 
And one of the things that Chuck said, he said, men, listen to me. Where the Bible is silent, you be silent. Don't feel obligated to speak on God's behalf where he doesn't speak. See, here's the deal about the Bible. Like, I didn't write it, you know? Like, I'm a guy just like you. Like, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I believe. I believe he's called me to be a pastor teacher, but I'm not Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, I'm learning and growing just like you are. And the challenge can be for some of us sometimes to kind of, to feel like, well, we got to speak into this situation. But the Bible, it doesn't. It may give principles to live by in that situation, but to take a stand, he says, listen, where the Bible is silent, so should we. If not, here's the deal. We take a reserved seat that's not ours. It's the judgment seat that belongs to God, not you nor me. Maybe you kind of know what this feels like if you have children. You know what it feels like when someone kind of maybe see something that your kid is doing and they kind of just like jump in and correct them or speak into it. And it's not a simple thing like, hey, just maybe hold the door for that person or say thank you. But they speak into something and correct that is something maybe, I don't know, a little gray. Well, like here, let me give you an example of uh, in my own life. I have five kids. My, my brother and his wife have four kids. And so when we get together, that makes nine. You're still with me, this one person over here nine so that's powerful and so fourth of july we were in my uh that we were all over at my mom and dad's house everyone's swimming in the pool playing games and just chaos nine kids that are like 10 11 under it's just chaos and so i've got this one kid that i love let me say this i love him and here he is his name is is liam neil spencer this is him on the last day of preschool and that red-headedness comes with its own blessings and, and wonderful challenges. Like, he's just a fiery guy. He's got so much energy. Like, honestly, around our house, he just runs around our house. It could be 8 a.m. or 9 p.m. He's just still got so much energy. Well, anyway, Liam and all of his cousins are in the pool. They're playing games. And then all of a sudden, I, I see Liam, like, get pushed in the pool. And he's still learning how to swim. Like, he's, he's getting it down, but he's not like this, like... He's not winning any Olympic golds at the moment. Like, he's four years old. So he's still navigating, still getting a little uncomfortable. He, he hops out of the pool and just tears coming down his face. So without, like, doing what I should have done, like, okay, well, what happened? And is, why did he get pushed? And, you know, he's a red, not, nothing against redheads. I love redheads. We have redheads in my family. I'm married to one. I, my mom is one. I love redheads. But, you know, like, I should have kind of found out maybe he did something to instigate. I got that, like, dad mad thing going and going, hey! Don't push him in the pool. And I thought, you know what? Hmm. I probably need to see what actually happened. So I, I kind of swam over to where all the cousins are and talk. Say, hey, tell me, tell me what happened over there. I said, well, we were playing this game where everyone, and Liam, he just keeps pushing everybody when we're not supposed to be pushed. And so I was like, oh, shoot. I made a mistake. I spoke into something, and I didn't like, you know, curse. Or, but I mean, you know what? I, I did... It was not like this loving tone. Let's put it that way. So this is what I had to do. I swam over there. I said, hey, I spoke to my nephew. I said, man, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I assume, you know, I didn't use the word assume. He's probably like, what are you talking about? But I said, hey, I, I, mean, I just kind of corrected when I should, really, really should have kind of considered more what was going on. And then I had to do the hard thing of like talking to his mom. Like, hey, I'm dumb. I'm an idiot. I spoke when I shouldn't have spoke and blah, blah, blah. Now we're all good. Don't worry. There's no fracture in the family, I don't think. But anyway, let me say this. You know what it's like when you feel like you step into a situation. You go, hey, don't say that to my kid. Like, you're not their dad. Here's what Paul is trying to say. Listen, you're not their God. People belong to him, not you. When it comes in those gray areas of life, let God take the seat that's reserved only for him. Let him make those judgment calls. See, when you're living life in the gray, and here's the deal, it's the nature of life. Not everything is clearly black and white all the time. Paul says this, first and foremost, accept one another because God accepts us. The second thing he says is, remember, people belong to God, not to you. And then he shares this third powerful principle in verses 5 through 9. He says in the same way, some think one day is more holy than another. While others think every day is alike, here's what you need to do. Be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food, they do so to honor the Lord. 
since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods, listen, they also want to please the Lord, and they give thanks to God. For we don't live unto ourselves or die to ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be both the Lord of the living and the dead. For the Jews, they had these special days. Gentiles, they may have had old holidays that were associated with their previous belief. But Sunday became the day for believers because it's the day that Jesus beat death. And the reality for me, I think Paul hits it on the head when he says, listen, others, they, they kind of approach each day alike. Every single day is a day to worship. On Sundays, we gather to hear the word, fellowship, pray, but worship is most primarily how you live. It's not just what you sing and listen to. It's life. That's what worship is. That's why Romans 12, 1 and 2, that's the hinge point of the book of Romans, which shows now this is how you should live. And what does it say? As a living sacrifice, as a lifestyle of worship that's acceptable to God. And Paul says it's not about a specific day, it's about Christ. In Colossians chapter 2, he really explains this where he says, don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths, for these rules are only shadows of the reality to come. Well, okay, it's the shadow. Well, what's the substance? Jesus, Christ himself is that reality. He's the fulfillment of every single one of those feasts and festivals. He's the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He's the purpose and the reason pointing to a perfect sacrifice. All that diet stuff, it pointed to Jesus. So Paul says this, listen. He's hinting at a key truth for the lens that we need on life when things are a little gray. He says, listen, run things through this sieve. See things through this lens. And what I doing, am I really doing it as unto God? Here's the third life lesson principle we see from Scripture this morning. It's not about my preferences, but it's about His priority in my life. See, the church of Corinth, they had a same challenge. Diets, days, calendar, circumcision. These were issues that they were disagreeing on. And Paul would write this. Listen, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. If what, I cause, if what I eat causes my brother to fall, I'll never eat meat again, he says in 1 Corinthians 8. And then lastly, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, whatever I do, I want to do for the glory of God. You know, in this Bible study group that I'm in on Tuesday nights, that book, The Pursuit of Holiness, the author said one of his friends kind of like put together this little, he called it the formula to discern between right and wrong when you kind of don't know what to do. And I thought it was helpful, so I want to put these four little points up there. He said, first and foremost, when you're considering something, ask this question. Is this helpful physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally? Is what I'm about to do, is it a wing or a weight? Netflix binging for 18 hours. How can we make a case that this is a wing, not a weight? Like maybe if you're like in a full body cast, you got into an issue, you just need to veg out. Maybe that's a wing right there. I don't know, but this helps bring clarity. Number two. Does it bring me under its power? If I keep doing this, is it kind of owning me? Is it this dynamic that it hurts somebody else? And lastly, does it bring glory to God? See, believers can disagree on the gray, but still be acceptable to God. But here's what Paul is writing. Life as a believer is not meant to be about you. Well, I can just do whatever I want. Right, I'm forgiven in Christ. I got that get out of hell card. No, it's about living with his priority in my life. It's not about living according to your preferences. See, let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. If you live your life as a believer just based on what you prefer, you're in bondage to yourself. You're still enslaved because you are steering the ship. And to be a Christian means to put Christ like that country song, you know, Jesus, take the thing. Like, Jesus is the one driving. It's about his priority. My preferences take the back seat. Are you really living that way? 
not in condemnation, but towards life. See, listen, when you're younger, at least for me, I'll just speak for myself, you kind of read God's word and you go, okay, no to this, ah, no to that, I'll do this, do that. And they're like bummers, like God's commandments seem like God's bummers. And the longer you live, you start to go, wait a second, those things that it said no to and yes to, the, the no's were the weights. <laughs> and if I gave myself to that, I, I'm coming down. And the things that it said to do, they're actually the wings in life. God's commandments are not God's bummers. God's commandments are God's enablements. They're his pathway. They give illumination to how you should live in such a way where you experience what Jesus said. I've come to give you life abundantly. His word is meant to be that lamp and light unto our path. So we're not stumbling around in the dark. Each believer should live under Jesus and allow the conscience that we have be brought under the authority of Scripture. And to realize this, that you know what, like it says in verse 7, we don't live in a vacuum. Everything we do affects others. If demonstrating our freedom causes us to hurt others, we're not free. We're in bondage to our own preferences. Jesus wants to set you free from that. You may not even realize that you needed to be set free from that. But an egocentric Christianity is a contradiction in terms. Christianity is about Christ first, and then his people, and then you're kind of last. Remember that old acronym, maybe we've talked about it a thousand times before? J-O-Y, J-O, yeah, J-O-Y. Not that smart. Jesus, others, you. Like that's life as a believer. I live for Jesus, I live for others, and then I allow God to take care of me. That's what he's saying here about how to live life in the gray. We are not our own masters. As much as this culture wants to tell you that that's the pathway to success, our entire life from beginning to end belongs to the Lord. We live and we die for him. What he says goes. That's where freedom is. And lastly this morning, as we close in these these four verses, verses 10 through 13, let me go ahead and share with you the truth that he's going to say. But he says in this next passage that when you remember where you're going to stand and kneel, it frames your today. Let me read this and I'll I'll explain what I mean by that. He says, why do you condemn another believer in verse 10? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For scripture says, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me. And every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, Each of us will give a personal account to God, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause a believer to stumble. Remember, where you're going to stand and kneel frames your today. You say, what do you mean by that? What you believe shapes how you behave. You you know what someone believes because of the way they live. Your lens determines the way you live your life. I mean, I don't think there's anyone here who wouldn't recognize that we live in a world with so many half-truths, so much misinformation, so much stuff out there that's hazy and foggy that it's hard to make good decisions on what to do because you don't have the right information all the time. The way you live your life, the great beauty of a believer is you have the right information in black and white and sometimes red. It's called the Bible. And when we stand and allow that to frame the way we live, we learn how to live life and navigate it when it's a little gray. See, here's what it says. Believers will stand and kneel before the judgment seat of Christ. That's what this text says. That believers, if you've got that get out of hell card, so to speak, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, let me have your attention. Don't miss this. You will stand and kneel before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. You say, well, what does that mean? I've read Romans. I've been hanging out with you online or in, on campus. I, I've learned that because of what Jesus has done, Romans 6, 7, and 8, my sins are dealt with. So what is this judgment seat of Christ? Let me read something to you from someone much smarter to me, than me and much more articulate. He says this. His name is Pastor Warren Wearsby. 
The word judgment seat is bima. It's the places where judges stood at the athletic games and gave out awards. He talks about how 1 Corinthians 3 speaks about this a little. Where Paul compares our ministries, our lives, how we live, how we worship the Lord. Kind of like with building a temple. He's giving an illustration. And he says if we build with cheap materials, that's not going to last, right? It'll just fall. Fire will burn it up. But if we use precious, good stuff, lasting materials, our works will last. Our works will pass the test. We'll even receive a reward. If they're burned up, we, we lose the reward, but still saved by yet as fire, he says. And so he says, "What? Well, this is his point. How does the Christian prepare for the judgment seat of Christ? By making Jesus Lord of life and faithfully obeying him. Instead of judging other Christians, we had better judge our own lives and make sure we're ready to meet Christ at the Bema. He says this, listen, believers, it's not like, man, I, I learned the gospel, now I just kind of live life. My preferences kind of dominate what I do. The bottom line kind of dominates what I do. What's happening at the moment kind of defines what I do. Man, you're missing out if that's the way you live your Christian life. What Paul says here is, wake up, believers. One day you're going to stand before the Lord, not unto judgment for sin, but for kind of like discernment for reward. Like, whoa, the way that you lived your life in your giving, the way that you lived your life in your purity, the way that you gave everything about who you were to loving God and loving others, there's reward for that. Now, here's the deal. I'm a guy just like you, human being. You know what? I've never been to the Bema seat. I don't, I don't know all the dynamics of it. But I have read the Bible. And I do understand that there's this dynamic for believers that we're supposed to live our lives in such a way that we're, we're, we're running a, a race. But we're not competing with those who are next to us. We're running the race that the Lord has before us in such a way to win the prize. The prize is not salvation. That's the free gift. But there's these reward ceremony. There's this dynamic where the New Testament speaks of five different crowns. Now, we're not going to get to heaven and go, man, your crown's got a couple more stones in it than mine. It's not that dynamic. Again, the Bible talks about how we'll lay all those crowns down at his feet. It's not about like, man, did you see the house that John Spencer got compared to like J.B. Schluter? Like, how did that work out in heaven? Like, it won't be like that. Don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. But I will say this. If you're living your life for anything less than eternal rewards, you're missing the point of why you've been saved and still given breath in your lungs. You're meant to run your race. You're meant to give to God and to others. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not this angry bit. No, your, your, your sins have been dealt with on the cross. And you may say, I don't care about crowns. You will. You will. You say, I don't care about those kind of, I just want to, a, a friend of mine uh, used to give this illustration of the Bema seat all the time about his son, Peter John. He'd say, you know, my boy Pete, when he was two or three, the best thing in the world for him was to get down on the kitchen floor, grab the pots and pans and just bang them and just have a grand old time banging pots. And he said, well, as a dad and, you know, maybe that's not the best thing for the pots, but I'm going to enjoy them. I'm going to get down and bang the pots with PJ. He said, but when he was 16 or 17, he, he, he was kind of over the pot banging thing. You know what I mean? Like, didn't have that much enjoyment to him. He'd rather borrow the keys to the car. And he said, that's kind of like what it's going to be in heaven. There's going to be some pot bangers. I mean, they're having a great time. They're banging those pots. And then there's others who woke up as believers and realized, Phew, it's not about how much money I make. It's not about that next vacation home. It's not about that next experience. It's not about this next endeavor. It's about living for the Lord and giving my life. Maybe there'll be the keys to the car in that kind of situation in heaven. Now, again, I haven't been to the Bema seat. <laughs> I don't know how all that's going to work out. But I do know enough to say this. God's called you to run your race as if to win and to invest your life in things that matter. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your, but just ask yourself, am I really living that way? Is knowing where I'm going to stand and where I'm going to kneel framing my today? Is it helping me when I make those decisions to buy that whatever? 
to, to spend all this money doing such and such, to give all my time and worry about whatever. Or maybe should I adjust a little, knowing that where I'm going to stand and where I'm going to kneel frames what I'm going to do with my life. And if you're an unbeliever this morning, let me say this. The Bible speaks of two different judgments. The judgment seat of Christ, which I've just taken way too much time to explain and probably left you more confused than you were at the beginning. And then there's the great white throne judgment. And that judgment is for your sins. The Bible teaches very clearly that you, you have one of two choices. You can either let this guy named Jesus pay that debt that you could never pay, or you can pay it for yourself. But payment for yourself means eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. That's what the Bible says. It's not necessarily what I would want to tell you on a beautiful Sunday morning. It's not like, hey, this is what, but this is part of the good news. The good news is that you're saved from that. And, and where you're going to stand or kneel should shape the choice that you make about Jesus today. For believers and unbelievers. Believers, live for him. Unbelievers, repent of your sin. Give your life to Jesus. Confess that he is Lord and, and take that goodness, right? Forgiveness, freedom, family, future. You know, one author I read this week made this statement for believers. He said this, Jonathan Edwards. He said, he resolved never to do anything which I would be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Maybe like a good like lens to put on for the day, like, and how I make my decisions, like, I just want to live for the Lord. Just want to live for Him. See, this morning, as we close, I'm going to go ahead and invite the, the band up. We're considering this, um, this lesson, this truth, this theme, this topic of when life's a little gray, right? And, and we've got these four life lessons. Let me just rattle them off one more time just so you can kind of grasp them. How do you live life when things are a little gray? Well, first and foremost, we accept one another because God has accepted us. Not talking about those things like, well, man, they're just saying that like to get drunk is cool. So they have Bible studies, wine and Bible, right? Like they're just doing it. Like, okay, we need to speak into that. But like that stuff where it's gray, man, accept one another because God accepts us. Number two, people don't belong to you. They belong to God. So don't like always feel like you got to speak into every situation. That seat is reserved for God. Number three, life's not about your preferences, but it's about his priority in your life. And then fourth and finally, where you're going to stand and where you're going to kneel should frame your today. Like knowing my future, where I'm headed. Believers, it's a good future. Like you're going to heaven and then you get like a bonus. You get the rewards. Like what's wrong with that? Like that sounds great. Live for those rewards. Nothing wrong with that. Unbelievers online or on campus this morning, man, just surrender your life to Jesus. It's the best thing in the world. Forgiveness and freedom, future, hope, family. Repent of your sins. That's the weight that's going to kill you and destroy you. And live for the Lord. Last thing I'll say, just a quick illustration and then we'll close in a song. That little redheaded boy that you saw on the screen, today is two weeks from his birthday. So about 156 days ago, Alexa has been telling us that every single day, right? And that knowledge of like, well, how long is that for that little four-year-old brain? We'd be like, well, it's this and this and this, like all these days. So the other day he was asking and he said, dad, how long? He says, 15 days. I said, buddy, it's like this. He goes, whoa. <laughs> his whole attitude changed. He started talking about what he's gonna do and all this stuff. His perspective changed because he knew what was coming. And the other night when we sat down to dinner, he was just in a good mood. He was actually eating all his dinner. He wasn't pinching anybody or he was just doing great. I said, how you doing, Liam? How was your day? He said, mommy said that if I make good choices, I get a hundred pennies. I said, wow. And those hundred pennies, like it, sh it shaped and formed what he was doing. As you live your life in the things that are gray, just fall back on the simple, man. Like, Jesus is coming back. I'm going to live for him. I don't want to like waste my time like, well, yeah, I can make a case for why I can still do this. I'm forgiven. Why do that? Why not let like the truth form and fashion the way that you live in such a way where the things that you're adding into your life are wings, both to you and to others, not weights. 
got nothing to lose in that scenario. The other thing is like pregnant with problems. Live for Jesus and follow him. If you wanted to simplify this whole thing, it's super simple. Man, just live for Jesus. Love other people. Live your life on mission, on mission for him. It's like the secret sauce that's really not a secret in the Bible. It's a relationship with him, a relationship with others, and purpose that's kingdom and eternally minded. That's how you live life in the gray. That's why our, I, I'm always probably ever only going to preach one message. Man, love God, connect together, and live on mission. I think if you do that, you're doing what God's called you to do. And God will produce fruit in your life. Thank you.